first founder um, with of rethinking Marxism. Now the uh, the uh, one man show, if you will, with with interviewees of the Economy Update, and uh, it's really out there. I think doing us all the service by uh, spreading the word in a way. He has really been great at that over the last 10 years. He's made it very special to a lot of people and uh, you know, and we really welcome him here. So he's he's the Massachusetts uh, group. Uh, you know, we have Cornell from New York. We have Rick who lives in New York, but comes out of Massachusetts to us here today. Thank you, Rick. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you all for being here honoring Stanley. He would have enjoyed it if he had been in the audience too. Um, it's a pleasure for me to, to do that. Uh, Stanley was a, never a teacher of mine in the sense of a classroom, but he was a teacher of mine in terms of, I guess, a role model of sorts. When I first encountered him, I was a student, college student, and he came to our university and um, gave a talk, which was very important. It was a small group of left-wingers um, trying desperately to do something significant uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, and um, against the pressures of Yale University, um, which was working very hard, as it always does to undermine and destroy anything of the sort we were trying to do. Even though we were a group of students and faculty there, they long ago understood that there would always be a few of those, but that they could crush them, which they have pretty well done for a long time. Um, and we brought Stanley up to help us strategize as to how to outwit Yale University. Um, Fortunately, that's not that difficult. Um, and of Yale, it has often been said that it isn't Harvard. Um, and no one can figure out whether that's an insult or a compliment. Um, I attended both those universities and I still can't figure out whether it's an insult or a compliment. I sit on the sidelines of the Harvard-Yale game trying to figure out, is there some way, any way, that they could both lose? <laughs> Stanley came up and gave us a talk. And I remember the talk, and that's what I want to say about Stanley. I remember the talk, as I'm sure everybody there did, was in a church right across the street from the campus, a local Methodist church that was progressive and allowed these kinds of events to happen. That's because, because Yale, across the street, regularly prohibited them from happening. And the church was therefore accessible to students. It's the church in which the unions were formed at Yale University. Um, when I got there, there was one union representing the building and grounds and kitchen workers. Now there are three locals of the same union. The second one organized the clerical and technical workers. And the third one, just a few months ago, became the local representing the graduate students who are workers at Yale. So that everybody at Yale is organized into a union, all the workers, with one exception, the faculty. Those geniuses have figured out how to stay out of a union longer than anybody else working there. And that's they, because they believe that the nonsense spewed by the Yale administration, and I say this as a proud graduate of that institution, um, convinces only the faculty. Everybody else knows better. And maybe at the end of my talk today, I'll tell you a bit more about it since your smiles indicate you're enjoying this, which is why I'm saying it. What Stanley told us that day was that it was really important never to forget that our organizing, working with those unions, the hotel and restaurant employees union, if you're interested in the, the national of which these are locals, um, it's always important, he said, not to give up 
or devalue your being students. Take being a student seriously. There's a lot to learn. And many of the people you will be working with haven't had the opportunity in life to take time off, to read, to think, to work with others. You are privileged in that way and you owe something in return to share that privilege with other people, not as the teacher and the student, but as the colleague who had some special opportunities and wants to share them, just like every worker has had his, her special opportunities to learn all kinds of skills you need to learn. But we had been lost as students in a silly debate about whether being a student was itself some sort of bad thing and that we had to show that we were real militants by having nothing to do with academic work. Or the, and there were a number of my fellow students, good students, good people, ended up giving, throwing away their educations because they felt somehow guilty about having them. There is something peculiarly American that I had to learn. I was born in Ohio, I'm an American and all that, but my parents were immigrants from Europe. And for them, the idea of being a radical or a revolutionary and being poor made no sense at all. The whole point was that everybody shouldn't be poor, but a Yale student appearing in rags and all the rest, which most of my colleagues were doing, as a sign of their solidarity with people who were horrified by how they looked, uh, never ceased to amaze me. Stanley jumped across all of that and told us, it's good to be a student, take it seriously, make this institution work for you. Don't you work for it. Very, very, for us, very powerful. Very powerful. And it stayed with me. And it is one of the things that could be many, and I'm sure many of you who are speaking will know about this anyway, but it's one of the things I wanted to say about Stanley that struck me as incredible. He always took theoretical work, academic work, scholarly work as central to what he was and what he wanted to have done. Yes, he worked with labor unions, Yes, he's probably best known for a whole host of things he did with the labor movement and around the labor. And I'm not in any way other than deeply respectful for what he did. But I want to talk about the coming together in this one man of a commitment to the theoretical, abstract, philosophical, whatever words you want, that that needs to be together. I know we all know the truism theory and practice have to be aligned and all, but he actually took that abstraction and made it very, very concrete in his work. He insisted to us that day back in, uh, God knows how many years ago in New Haven, he insisted that the two things go together. He insisted that his work, if we admired him for his civil rights and all of that as civil liberties and labor movement work. If we admired him for that, he wanted us to understand. And he looked at the audience when he said it. This comes out of my study of Marxism. Now, remember, that's many years ago. We're talking the height of the Cold War. It took courage even to say that in a public forum. The press was there, the local press uh, in New Haven. Um, it is an important institution because one of the few not owned by Yale University. I mean, owned in the practical sense for sure, but not in the legal sense of the term. Uh, my Marxism, he said, is what helps me understand. You think I'm successful? I'm just applying Marx and not that creatively either. He was self-deprecating in that way. Not always, as I'm sure you know, but in that situation, he was. Uh, and, and was what we as students needed badly to hear. In subsequent years, that was my relationship to him. Uh, I spent a good bit of my life uh, doing theoretical work. I was a professor at a university. It's what I've done as my job in life uh, up until 2008. Um, I taught at the University of Massachusetts. 
only be, I don't know how many of you know that place. It is out in the middle of no place. Um, it's very rural. It's that arrangement here in America in which to deal with the danger that students represent as a potential, you want to get them out of the centers of power. So Boston is at one end of the state and the university is as far in the other direction as you can go and still be in Massachusetts if that's what you want. The students are isolated, it's a rural area. The only sign of Boston is the grotesque corruption that is, all the dormitories in, in Amherst, Mass, where the university is located, are tall buildings. They were built by the Volpe Construction Company from Boston, which only knows how to build tall buildings because it's an urban thing. They got the contract, you'll never guess how. So on this rural campus where the one thing they have is an enormous amount of land, they built vertically. And the students to this day live in an absurd tower, carefully kept from a recognition of the absurdity of the situation. Typical for most universities to do something like that. This one not accepted, but I won't insult my hosts, so I won't go there. Here's what Stanley and I would talk about in the intervening years. Marxist theory. He once sat me down and said, okay, I want you to tell me how you see the labor theory of value. Okay, first of all, it's interesting if you're an economics professor, which I've been, and you've taught this material for umpteen years, which I've done, you'd be amazed how rarely anyone asks you such a question. The answer is that the, the labor theory of value, which Stanley knew, but he was kind of half asking and half giving me a midterm quiz. And I said to him, well, the first way I deal with this is to remind everyone that it shouldn't be referred to as Marx's labor theory of value because the originator of the labor theory of value was not Marx, Adam Smith. The hero of capitalist economics is the originator of the labor theory of value. It was worked on and changed by David Ricardo, another hero of capitalist economics, referred to in virtually every textbook on the history of economics as the founders of the modern science of economics. The professor of religion, Adam Smith, that's what he was. Notice the connection between the theory of capitalism and religion, think about that. David Ricardo, a banker in London, Marx came along, thanked them generously for the labor theory of value. If you ever look at Marx's theories of surplus value, his other multi-volume work, he is full, literally a hundred pages of praise of the innovation achieved by Smith and Ricardo. A, a level of praise and, a, and, and recognition that no modern economist has ever given Marx, but Marx gave to his, the people he felt indebted to. And then Marx changed it, made it his version of the labor theory of value. Stanley smiled and said, B plus, he said, B plus, you, you did well. You did. So we went on to discuss it. And then he said, what, is, what does the economics profession think of it? And I mean, then I think he was more asking than testing. And I said, the economics profession has nothing to say. It's irrelevant. Asking them about the labor theory of value is like asking them, you know, what color is Thursday? They don't, it doesn't work. They don't associate the category color with the category Thursday. So that they start struggling to find the answer because you know how difficult it is for a professor to be asked a question for which that professor doesn't know the answer. The phrase, ooh, I don't know, comes very difficultly to professors that we're supposed to know. So they don't know. And I say the reason they don't know is because they think economics is about explaining the great mystery called price. Why is your shirt $16, but your socks $4? Why is the ice cream $1.50 and the Mercedes Benz, $50,000. Well, 
this mystery, which for capitalistically oriented people, people who live with a market, that's a great question. And I said, they can't answer the question about the labor theory of value because all they've ever understood is it's a theory of why prices are what they are. And that was not Marx's interest. To use a colloquialism, he didn't give a shit what the prices were. He was interested in the relationship between human being over time in the act of production. It was a completely different question. If you don't understand the question, then you will not understand the theory in intended to answer the question. Stanley loved this. A week later, he went to a conference where he presented all of this very kindly. He came back to me because he said he got it from me. He was very careful that way. But he loved it. He said now his, he can go to workers and talk to them because our conversation evolved into the important difference when you're organizing a union, the important difference of understanding that for Marx, the concept of the working class was based on a recognition of a fundamental difference between two kinds of worker, two kinds of labor, what Marx called productive and unproductive labor. One of them exploited by the capitalist, the other not. And this enables me now to understand, we've got to organize, said Stanley, we've got to organize these workers who enable exploitation of other workers because they're not in the same relation. And they can be together in a political powerhouse movement to overthrow capitalism. That's what we're after. But that doesn't mean we forget or deny the differences between them. Something had to be learned very bitterly later on by many organizers who still don't get it, who prefer other differentiations that aren't Marxist, like blue collar, white collar, skilled, unskilled, all interesting differences among workers, but not the one that Marxist theory said, let's focus on because we don't want to miss this one. It will undo our efforts. Here was Stanley taking the most abstract theoretical work in Marxian theory, buried in those early sections of volume one of Capital, and using them to correct the strategy he was advising labor unions who had a mixture of production workers and clerical workers to work together so they didn't blow each other out of the water or fail to have a unified movement. For me, that was another lesson from Stanley. He was helping me understand the link. And when I thought about what I might say here today, besides recognizing the extraordinary commitment he had to doing that, not allowing this system to separate the intellectual, theoretical, scholarly from the activist organizing on the street, really recognizing both of them as necessary, not just in our movement, but in all of us as individual members of a movement, I thought was the most remarkable. And I guess besides saying it, let me say something to you that may interest you. I am now with Stanley's advice. He urged me to do. One of the first things I did when I quote unquote, retired from the University of Massachusetts in 2008 and moved into the city. I was living in Connecticut before, moved here into the city. My only regret ever since has been that I didn't do that move much, much sooner. Um, I, I find living here one of the greatest periods of my life for many reasons. I love this city, but, but that I did before, but living here is just Amazing. But when I did it and moved, Stanley said to me, all right, if you really agree with this youth theory practice of the way you've been talking, then I advise you to do that now. Do it now. Keep your foot in the academic universe. Do the research. Do the scholarship. So I did it. I still do. I'm teaching this semester. I teach at the, the new school down in Manhattan, lower Manhattan where I'm a visiting professor. 
which is a, a euphemism for part-time professor. Um, you know, other euphemisms, adjunct, they have all, all the horrible language for, that enables them to pay you less um, and has no other significant function. He said, and use it to work in your political practical work. Well, I, I do work with unions, but it's not the way Stanley did, not on that scale and not with that intensity. But I decided I would try because an opportunity opened up with WBAI, which gave me that program um, back in 2000, when was it, um, 11, um, to try to do popular economics. Basically, that's, and that was Stanley urging me to do that. And I did it. And here I want you to understand, uh, and by the way, just so you know, that's why Michael was very kind to tell the mention that you might know who I am. Our pro we produce a weekly half hour program goes uh, is broadcast on about a hundred radio stations across the country every week is produced simultaneously as a television station. It goes out over four networks into about fifty five million homes. Now, obviously, they're not all watching. But they could, if they click that little thing, they could actually, by, by happenstance, you know, leap over the porno channel and land on me, you know? Yes. Um, who knows? Um, we just crossed 300,000 YouTube subscribers, which is a healthy number for a group like us. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an us now, it's no, I can't possibly do all that. So there's two full-time, three half-time, two gig workers, I pay them all. We raise enough money to do that. I don't run away from the title, you know, the label socialist. I don't run away from the label Marxist. I pretty much openly espouse it. We don't get hate mail, hardly any. I kind of worry about that, but I don't get any. And here's what I want you all to know in honor of Stanley. I do applied Marxism. That's what I do. I learned it. I studied it. I taught it. And that gave me the ability, slowly accumulated with trial and effort, to use it to talk about the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, the war in Ukraine, or anything else that comes up that I got to deal with doing a regular program like that. It's applied Marxism. If I have achieved some success in these 10 years, if I have an audience that big, if we publish books by now, we do all kinds of things. We're, we're trying to follow in the steps of, I don't know, Amy Goodman and the Monthly Review, however you want to think about it. Um, then it's because of the of Stanley's idea that do the theoretical work, use it to shape a consistent assessment of what's going on. And if you do it, people will respond, will like it, will find it instructive, be willing to listen at least halfway to the political arguments you want to offer. It's a recipe that will work. Stanley insisted it worked for him. He urged it on me. I followed it. You draw your own conclusions. That was a very remarkable thing. In my education, I was very lucky, not just with Stanley. But, you know, I've worked in, in my lifetime mostly by accident of interaction with uh, Paul Sweezy and Magdorf, who were my teachers, uh, literally in economics. Uh, because of where I went to school, I encountered a man whose name I, I want to mention, Fritz Pappenheim, some of you may know, wrote a wonderful book called uh, Alienation of Modern Man, was a personal tutor of mine all through college, taught me Marxism. In the original German, he was a German refugee. My mother was born in Berlin. My first language is German. Um, th these accidents. And because of Pappenheim, I worked with Marcuse because he taught at Brandeis, which was just up the street 
from where Marcuse lived. And because of my family, I studied for a good long while with the French Marxist, uh, Louis Althusser, in France, because my father is French and I spoke French as well as German at home. Uh, but Stanley, best of all of them, and they were great, and many of them have bigger reputations perhaps than Stanley. But if it comes to that question of the relationship of the theory to the practical political work, then Stanley is the standout capturer of that important point, recognized by all the others whose names I've given you, but not quite as embodied in them as it was in him. It was an extraordinary gift that he gave to people who he encountered and, and lived with. And that's why I'm here today to honor. I mean, Michael brought me because Michael is a, a good organizer, but I'm here to honor that particular part of Stanley because it was um, so very remarkably uh, articulated by him. And I also want you to know that it is a, it is a way to reach people not only does the abstract theoretical work reading Karl Marx not alienate you from people, it's exactly the opposite. It gives you a way of understanding which you can then present in your own words or the idioms of your time to the people who need to hear it and who will welcome it because it clarifies what they're up against and what they're struggling to do. The only other person besides Stanley who pops into my mind of having done that in another way, you'll be surprised perhaps, is Sigmund Freud, opening up our own unconscious and self-consciousness, that whole other register of our minds and how it works. It's an unbelievably powerful tool to understand the mess we're in. And Stanley liked to teach Freud and psychology. And that's why he understood it. He conveyed that to us. He understood it. it, it it's a remarkable capability. And I would urge, if I can do honor to Stanley one last way, that all of you think about how you in your life, your work, can replicate each of us in our own way this model of Stanley's of taking, taking that kind of stuff seriously. It is, after all, like Karl Marx himself, a professor of philosophy, writes a doctoral dissertation on ancient Greek philosophy, ends up losing his academic jobs because he's involved in the struggles of the communities where, where he's teaching, and eventually becomes an activist with the labor movement and social change movement. And exactly, exactly. And Stanley was the one who liked to compare himself to Marx in that particular way, but he was right. He was entitled to do it because he actually did it. So anyway, thank you for your time. And I think Stanley is worth our getting together to celebrate. for a minute or two, we're going to move on to the other panels, but if you have any questions for Rick uh, really quickly, he'll comment or comments. Yeah, Jesse, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I always think to myself, and I'm just that this is the only way to tell my story now. I think to myself, kind of, I'm just kind of like, you know, like, you can think whatever you like, but I'm just kind of like, you know, you can have your own perspective. And then really when I do, it's because I write about people bullying and the way they look on the boys' society and the other things on me. And I teach a, um, empathy level for them.
quote which is basically trying to create my mark vision when I talk to my students about all this and I use that early mark idea of you know creating your what your personal gifts are to be able to give directly to see the laws and the understanding that you're able to make that impact. But it's not like you make something you give it to some other person who's going to sell it, it's going to make money, and you make money, or like you just need to keep money from somebody else. It's like that relationship. Mark is all about that beautiful relationship where it's like your creative gift directly to give to yeah. other people and see how you contribute to the world. You're just like everything is about that. So you're just making me realize how much family and everyone right. has been in my life because I just created this whole eight to 12 hour program. Yeah. Good, good. You know, you, your reference in your speech there, your reference to undercover being an undercover Marxist. Um, there was a moment with in Stanley's life where where he and I had to collaborate on that. He had gotten the appointment finally here at the graduate center, and you know the academic rigmarole when you get an appointment like that the authorities who make the final decision have to assemble a dossier a folder on you. And one of the components of that folder is it's all a ritual as ancient and absurd as the funniest example you could draw from organized religion. Now, one of its components is letters, letters from appropriate other academics at other institutions certifying that you are not hiring you know, a bartender, but you are hiring somebody. I mean, no respect to bartenders. They're some of my closest friends um, for obvious reasons. Um, the, uh, but so Stanley calls me up one day in a panic. <laughs> he says, do you have a piece of stationery nearby from your university of Massachusetts? Oh, yes, I, I, like all good professors, I steal. <laughs> Paper, you know, rubber bands, nail, you know, uh, paper clips, you know, all of that. Uh, given what they, given what they pay us, they're lucky I don't steal more, right? Um, so I said, yes, I have the piece of paper. He said, well, like they got the, they're, they're short, and I don't know what I get. he had never asked me. Uh, that's the truth of it. But so I said, sure, sir. When do you need it? He said, this afternoon. Uh, we well, we solved that problem. So I wrote out, but we had to collaborate because he couldn't risk telling them who he was exactly and what he believed because then they, they might go the other way. Even if the people who were making the appointment wanted it, they it would have to go up the ladder and all that. So he and I crafted a very carefully academically written total bullshit about about him and his research and what his projects were. I mean, just made up, you know, in 20 minutes of intense telephone conversation. So yeah, undercover, he had to be uh, undercover. I want you to know though, because it's misunderstood by folks on the left that under certain circumstances in the United States, you don't need that. We got that job, the group of us who taught the Marxist economics at UMass, we got that job in 1973, the height of the Cold War. That university hired people who were explicitly at that time, political economists, heterodox economists, Marxists, lots of language about it. They hired us. They hired us even though uh, the, the leading economist of the time, a man named Paul Samuelson, taught economics at, at MIT, went to the governor of Massachusetts and told him not to do it. We had to get, like Stanley had to get me, we had to get, give you an example, I don't mind telling you this, in the middle of the night, I had to call my friend, a man named Kenneth Arrow, I don't know if the name means anything to you, a, a Nobel Prize winning economist, because he had to write a letter to the governor of Massachusetts offsetting what Samuel said. John Kenneth Galbraith at that time was in a cabin in the Alps with a lady whose name I will not give you because every 
Every one of you knows her. Everyone in this room knows her. But she was married to somebody else. And but we had to get him out of whatever situation he was in in that moment to get him to inter. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been hired. But we, the bottom line, we were. The governor of Massachusetts had to sign off on that. We got the job. I taught there for 35 years. There are hundreds of Marxist economics professors across the United States who got their PhD from us at the University of Massachusetts and are doing all kinds of really good work and abroad as well. So the things that are possible are much larger than you might imagine them to be here in the United States. It's on us more than ever before. We had a hard situation, much easier now. I get invited as a Marxist all over the place. My last, I mean, two weeks ago, I gave a big talk, get ready, at Texas Christian University. They know who I am, it's very hard for me to hide it. I know that part of why is I have a pedigree for reasons of my family's hysteria, excuse me, interests. Um, I had to go to Harvard and Stanford and Yale. Those are the only schools I ever, and I have those pedigrees. And believe me, I wave them every time the devil gets close. It's my version of garlic, right? And it works better than garlic. So I've been protected by the pedigree. I could be a Marxist because they're intimidated, my colleagues, by those institutions. They shouldn't be. Nothing happens there. For those of you who don't know, let me be the first to help you understand. Nothing happens there that's any different from what happens anywhere else, which is no compliment. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, uh, for yeah. this. We're on the line. Someone, uh, yeah, yeah, one more. But Yeah, two, two things. It, I do have a group that work with me. The substances I mostly do, but all the forms, which includes all of that, that's skilled people who, they don't come to me for what we pay them. They come because they like the project and they, they want to do it. And, but the other thing, I don't want them to beat, beat the horse. The other thing is, it's the Marxism. It's the attempt over all these years to teach my students at UMass or wherever else I've taught who, who don't come with a lot of the background to get them to understand the bit. And that teaches you how to make it accessible and interesting, a little sexiness, a little humor, a little sarcasm woven in. And then you get the reaction, which as a teacher and a human being is what we all want, right? We want that, that moment of connecting in the eyes or in the voice of, a, of the student or the friend, uh, the aha moment, well, you get that. And if you do it long enough, then you begin to understand what Stanley was saying. Use the Marxist theory. It's the best accumulation of insights into the flaws and failures of capitalism. And now, and this is my opinion, obviously, now that the American capitalist system is in decline and the empire down with it, we are going to have the next 50 years what the British have suffered the last century, the end, returning to what you once were, a cold, wet, offshore island of Europe. That's very hard for the British. Look how crazy their system has become. We are now on that same path. The flaws and failures of capitalism were one thing to leap over and hide when you're going up. Very different story when you're going down. We're, we're living that. But it's a time when a critique of capitalism has an audience. And I can assure you from my work, that audience is huge and growing faster than we can meet it. It's a good time 
to be a Marxist. So we're going to move right away to the next panel, which will be the panel on labor and power. Uh, uh, Kristen Lawler, Bruno Gulli, Peter Bratzis, and Manny Ness will be uh, on this panel um, up here. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll make room for you, please. Looking forward to this very much. And by the way, all four of these uh, persons were students of Stanley, direct students, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you so much for coming.